Hello dear viewer and welcome back to the last of my series 11 reviews, the long awaited review of The Battle of Ranscor at Colos. <laughs> Now, I would like to apologise for this review being so late. Pretty much we've had some renovation works being done on our building, which have meant uh, recording in December was basically a no-go. Uh, where I am sitting right now in my flat was full of plants last week, and uh, the area with the sofa... Look, the sofa is currently up against a wall while we've got some other stuff stored where the sofa usually is. So it's not business as usual around here yet, but I was determined to get these last Jodie Whittaker reviews out before the new series premiered. So uh, let's see what I think of the Battle of Ranscor of Kolos. This is the weakest episode of the series. There is a lot in it that does not stand up to scrutiny. There is definitely stuff to like here. Even though we know, for instance, that Graham will never kill Simshar. Spoiler alert, Simshar's the villain. The scene with him and the Doctor discussing it and her saying to him, our friendship will be over, you won't travel with me anymore. I believe Jodie Whittaker's Doctor in that moment. And I love the quietness of it. It's something I've really come to appreciate in her character where lines that earlier Doctors might have shouted, Jodie will just say very, very quietly and control the conversation that way. We do have the scenes in Paltraki's spaceship and Mark Addy is very effective in those scenes. Now, of course, he got his big break way back in The Full Monty. For genre fans, he may be more familiar to you as King Robert in the first series of Game of Thrones, but he is always a very imposing screen presence. He walks on screen, your eye is immediately drawn to him because he is a large, heavy-set man. To then introduce him and have him almost childlike, not sure what's going on, I really enjoyed that because it gave him a chance to play a role in a way I had not seen him before. And even as his memories come back to him, he is not some bull in a china shop. He is a considered character who thinks about the consequences of his actions and tries to plan through. And as he recovers each little bit of his memory, there's just a little tiny spark of joy there. I think it's a very clever thing to pair Yaz with him, much like it was to pair Yaz with Willa a couple of weeks ago in The Witchfinders. Yaz is someone who can talk to someone who has been through a trauma and knows how to handle that person. As opposed to, say, Ryan last week upsetting Hannah, Yaz can gently coax and persuade someone. She even says to Paltraki, look, don't push at it too hard. It'll come to you in time. But this is a double-edged sword because when Paltraki does regain his memories, there's no kind of twist to what's going on. Just shortly after I watched this, I watched Captain Marvel for the first time and not to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but there is a twist in that. And the same kind of twist could have been effectively employed here. But instead, everything Paltraki says is exactly as he says it is. And something that Chris Chibnall and his production team have very consciously done is give us very straightforward stories that do occasionally raise questions, but there's very little ambiguity in them. This is an episode that could have really done with that ambiguity though. You've got Graham threatening to kill Sim Shah. You've got the Doctor saying, I will reject you if you do that. You've got people who can't quite remember who they really are. All of that is crying out for a bit of ambiguity that reveals that maybe Graham is only prevented from killing Sim Shah because Ryan gets in the way and you don't then know whether Graham would have done it or not. Look, I'm glad he didn't, because I want to keep the character of Graham around, and I really like the character of Graham, but just some ambiguity would be really nice. Something else I really like about this episode is the use of colour and the cinematography, especially inside the Uxes temple building. You have all those brilliant yellows. But this is also where it starts to fall apart a bit for me, because 
we're back in the paper mill. And I don't know if it's the paper mill that's been used in so many new series Doctor Who stories, but as we look at this building from the outside, it's not so much been built as it has been woven by the mental energies of Andoneo and Delph. But when we get inside, there's so much of it that is heavily industrial. And it's not like Sim Shah has brought that stuff with him. And when we've seen Sim Shah's technology back in The Woman Who Fell to Earth, it's more crystalline based and indeed very organic. And I get why the production team have chosen to use this existing industrial setting, but it just doesn't match the outside and it doesn't match what little we learn about the Ux. Getting to the Doctor's confrontation with Sim Shah, I think it's a really, really good scene. And I think it's also an intelligent idea to bring back Sim Shah, the villain from the beginning of the series to the end of the series, to give him another confrontation with the Doctor. That scene where really they're just talking to each other and discussing Sim Shah's plan, something that resonated with me so early on was Sim Shah is saying pretty much to the Doctor, this is your fault. Look what you made me do. And that is the language of an abusive person, someone who cannot take responsibility for their own actions. And remember, Sim Shah is a cheat, even by the rules of his own people. So they foist that responsibility on others. It's not Sim Shah's fault he's destroying worlds. It's the Doctor's fault, because the Doctor put him in this situation. But as the Doctor points out, she tried to send him home. All she was trying to do was save lives, including Sim Shah's. His injuries were a result of his own arrogance and hubris. And I remember leading up to this on our flashcast, Jodie Into Terror, what I'd been saying all season is I wanted the Doctor to be put in a situation where she would have to make an incredibly hard choice. And in that hard choice, she would have to perform a questionable action. So think things like the 11th Doctor not preventing Solomon's death, or the 10th Doctor drowning the Rachnos, or the 12th Doctor shooting the General. I thought, I thought this episode would be that situation, but when the Doctor just says, your actions are not my responsibility, but I'm going to fix them anyway, and walks away from Simsha. He's not important in this situation. Fixing the problem is important in this situation. And it undercut my expectations. So we do have a little bit of unpredictability in this episode, and I loved it. I loved that we're not having a plot here where the Doctor is forced to pick up a gun. Because as my friend Nathan on Flight Through Entirety says, if your script forces the Doctor to pick up a gun, you've probably written the wrong script. <laughs> but instead, the Doctor here stays true to herself and true to what she said to Graham. You know, I can attack a door or I can attack a wall, but I'm not going to attack a being, I'm not going to attack a person. She stays true to that by walking away from the situation to solve the problem they're in. I like the Mission Impossible aspect, because you've got people dividing up into three, you've got the Doctor going after Sim Shah, you've got Graham and Ryan trying to free the hostages, and you've got Yaz and Paltraki trying to find out what's in those strange crystal things. And those crystal things look cheap as hell. They really do. They, oh, they just look like Perspex stuck together, higgledy pickledy with resin. And look, I suppose it's worth commenting on because I think it's been the only really bad design decision for me anyway, this series. But it just sticks out when the design of everything else that the production team have designed, I've already mentioned I don't like the interiors of the Ux building, but the design itself of other stuff looks really, really great and I enjoy that. On the topic of the Ux, look, I like the idea that they're kind of space wizards. <laughs> you know, conjuring things out of thin air. They can create anything. They have incredible mental powers. I like the idea of this. I find 
their corruption a bit too simplistic. And Dinio and Delph both express doubt of what they are doing, yet they have already shrunk down these five planets as part of Simshar's plan to put the planets in stasis. But Simshar's plan hasn't been successful. The Doctor speculates that everyone on these planets is already dead. And I feel like the episode is trying to have its cake and eat it too, but not being successful in either thing. Because if Simshar had shrunk the planet successfully but everyone on it was still alive, the Doctor then has a moral victory in restoring those planets, because not only is she returning planets to their rightful place in time and space, but she is saving planets worth of people. But for Simshar to fail in his plan to put these people into stasis, and then for the Doctor to just kind of go, oh, that's terrible. She reacts with sorrow, she reacts with indignation, but it's all gone in a few seconds, and the story still ends with her sending the planets back to their regular place in time and space, but it's a hollow victory because they're just lifeless hunks of rock now. I feel like that line about the planets being extinguished of all life was just put in to make us go, ooh, that evil Tsim Sha, but there's no payoff to it. We already know he's a blackguard, you know? We already know that he's a bad guy. It doesn't make us feel any more animosity towards him. Oh, I see what they're going for, but it doesn't carry any weight. And because it doesn't carry any weight, it comes off as disrespectful and flippant when it could have been a really big moment. It could have been a moment for the Doctor to get properly angry. But I don't feel like the Doctor ever really gets massively angry here. As for when Simshar is getting ready to shrink Earth, we already know it's a couple of thousand years in the future, so is the Ux absorbing it in their own time or from our time? Because I believe it's Yaz does comment, you know, seven billion people are about to die, talking about the entirety of the human race. Yaz never reacts like her family is back home, and we never see any reaction on Earth to the sky suddenly turning red. We don't get a scene with Yaz's family. We don't get Naja calling Yaz and saying, where are you? What is happening? We need you home because something horrible is happening. We don't get any of that, so there is so little emotional resonance. On Flight Through Entirety, it's something we call word peril. You know, we're told that the planet Earth is in danger, we kind of see it, but that could be any planet. That could be Scaro, that could be Woman Wept, that could be Vortus for all we care. There's just no resonance there. And the Doctor then comes up with her very clever plan, which involves taking off those neural blockers that she and Yaz have, and we know, we've been told several times that if you take off your neural blocker, it can do funny things to your psyche, you can imagine people are about to attack you, it can make you paranoid, it can make you violent. And the Doctor and Yaz just each get a little bit of a mild headache and some blurry vision. This is one of the episodes where Yaz gets the least amount to do. As we see with the conclusion of the episode, Ryan and Graham are freeing the hostages, Paltraki goes to help them, the two Ucks are helping out the Doctor, the Doctor is doing stuff with the TARDIS and shouts out, I need all of you. Yaz is outside just looking at the little planet crystal things and reporting back that yeah they've gone and then she gets to run away from an explosion and I have to say in terms of the whole Doctor Who companions have to be good at running Mandip Gill has an excellent Doctor Who run she just gets nothing to do here she doesn't have the emotional core of Ryan and Graham confronting Simshar about Grace's death and I have to say that Graham's confrontation with Simshar is another standout scene and I love the fact that Graham shoots him in the foot. As he says to Ryan, it was just to shut him up, it was just to stop him, don't tell the Doctor she'll be bad at me. I really love that. I love that they put Simshar in stasis 
and then when they leave, everyone locks up the building. So he gets poetic justice in that because that is his way of tormenting his victims and he will be tormented in the same way. I'm sure they're going to bring him back. We've still got the planet of desolation where the Stenza were conducting experiments and the Timeless Child, which I'm sure will be a thing in series 12. I'm absolutely certain of that. So I, I don't think we've seen the last of Simsha. I hope we haven't seen the last of Simsha. As I've said, I find him a really interesting character. His involvement in this plot works. The basic plot itself works. It's just that so much of it is told to us and we're expected to go, oh, well, that would be a very bad thing to have happen, but we're not shown any of the consequences of that. I'm thinking shrinking the earth. I am thinking the neural blockers, which, you know, they go off and they don't really have any effect on anything. And I'm thinking of the ending itself when the Ux go off with Paltraki and his crew. I don't really get why. They were wandering this planet for ages, so this is kind of their home. They could stick around and guard Simsha, and that could be their penance for what they've done, because even though they were fooled, they've still had a hand in destroying five civilizations. Part of Doctor Who is always about responsibility, and of course Simsha doesn't accept his responsibility, but here neither did the Ux. Simsha not accepting responsibility for his actions leads to him being locked in stasis, whereas the Ux not accepting responsibility for their actions, they get let off? It doesn't quite feel right to me, and I think the Doctor should have had something to say, even something to say to the Ux of, your lives are going to be very difficult, you've hurt a lot of people, and you need to make amends for that. That could have been something that the Ux could have said. Because all they say is they're going to go off and find themselves a proper home. Instead, they could have said, actually, we have a lot of reparation to give to the people we have hurt. What if instead of finding their own home, they built new homes, rebuilt the civilizations on the planets that they helped wipe out? None of these things I'm suggesting would change the overall plot. So the overall plot is solid. And I like the central idea of the first foe that this Doctor fought coming back to haunt her, and the Doctor turning around and saying, your actions are your own. I gave you a chance. And then the Doctor not even dealing with the villain herself, but just dealing with the fallout of his actions. I really like that. It tells Simsha, you are not important enough for me to bother with. And that is a very risky writing move because we, the audience, could feel he's not important enough for the Doctor to bother with. But I think he does present himself as enough of a threat that we understand that the reason the Doctor is dealing with the situation and not him is A, because the situation is more important and B, because she has faith in her friends to deal with him and to deal with him in a way that she would agree with. In the end, I give the Battle of Ranskarov Kolos a 6 out of 10. It's gone down in my estimation because a lot of the things I had a problem with, last year I was aware of but I just didn't have a problem with them, but watching it again without acknowledging things like the neuroreceptors or the fate of the Ux, it just felt really hollow. It felt like Chris Chibnall didn't care about answering those questions. And that's really disappointing. I think adding to the disappointment of this episode for a lot of people is that we are used to the series finale of a Doctor Who series in the modern era being a big spectacle. Whereas this is quite quiet and self-contained. Even single episode finales in the past, like The Wedding of River Song or The Name of the Doctor, they feature big revelations about main characters, whereas this is just another episode. I totally get the disappointment behind this being the weakest finale of the new series. My resolution video will be up very shortly because I do not have long to get it all out before the new series premieres. <laughs> but until then, thank you very much for watching.